the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Fletcher. And I'm Mark Deason. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell now? Well, <laughs> so it is the, uh, it is the uh, holiday season, and every year, my most popular column in the Washington Post, two columns that I do at the end of every year, are my top 10 list for the 10 best things that Donald Trump did in the previous year and the 10 worst things that Donald Trump did in the previous year. And lo and behold, these are the biggest columns I do. People love end of the year reviews and they're, you know, it's a useful exercise to go through and look at the past year and see what the president has done right and also what the president's done wrong. And I've, you know, did, so, you, know you know me, Danny, like I've tried to call balls and strikes. I've tried not to get Trump derangement syndrome and attack everything he does and give up previously held positions where just because I'm supporting the president. But I've also tried not to pull my punches when I think the president has done something wrong. And I think that's the right place to be. And I and this is how I do it every year at the end of the year, by giving him credit where credit's due and also uh, calling him out when he does the wrong thing. So we are doing this a little bit differently this time. We're ne- we have no guests. In essence, Mark and I are our guests. We're going to do two shorter podcasts that are conversations between the two of us. And uh, our first podcast is going to be on uh, all the things that Donald Trump has done right that will reflect our discussion on Mark's uh, Washington Post column. And then the second podcast is going to be on, on... You're going to like the second one better, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, not only that, but the, the first podcast will be like five minutes long, folks, and the second oh, podcast will, come on. <laughs> will be like two hours. Oh, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're looking forward to it. I hope you'll enjoy this. Mark, tell us the top 10. Number 10. He continued to deliver for the forgotten Americans. So, you know, our economy is humming. The unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in a long time. And the people who are gaining the most out of this economy right now are people who vote, put Donald Trump in office, the working class voters, people on the lower end of the economic spectrum who were being ignored by the establishment of both parties. This is why Donald Trump is president, because these voters turn to him. And you look back on his record, he's delivering for those voters. Yeah, I think that it's very hard to argue that. You know, when, when people say to me, you know, Donald Trump has been terrible for our nation. You know, first of all, it's hard to make the case in Washington, D.C. that Donald Trump has been terrible. You know, the, the newspapers are flourishing. The Washington Post is making money. You know, all of the networks are doing better than they ever have. So when you <laughs> talk about the cult, the culture of criticism of Donald Trump has profited immensely. But the people who we see much less of, who don't appear on the front pages of the newspapers, are the ones who really have had a difference in their lives. Wages have gone up at the bottom of the income scale. African Americans, who have always suffered more from unemployment than white working age Americans, have also picked up strength. You know, this is great news, and I don't begrudge Donald Trump one bit of credit for this. Absolutely. And look, what was amazing is watching the last Democratic debate. I don't know if you got to enjoy it over there in Australia, Danny, but uh, it was quite a quite a spectacle. And all of the Democrats, basically, they, they were asked, you know, the economy is doing great. You know, how do you make a pitch to the American people that who might not like Donald Trump personally, but are benefiting from his policies that he should be replaced? What's your argument? And they all to a T said, no, the economy is not doing well. And, you know, this is a theme that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have picked up, and it's now been picked up by Biden and Buttigieg and Yang and all all the others. Well, the economy is working great for millionaires and billionaires, but ordinary Americans are getting lost. And it's just factually not true. There was a Quinnipiac poll just last week. 57 percent of Americans say that they are better off financially since Donald Trump came into office. There was a uh, a poll, a Marist poll this summer that asked Americans, is the economy working well for you personally? Two thirds of Americans said it was, and it was in every demographic group, people without a college education, non-whites, independents, 
every generation from Gen Z all the way to the silent generation, urban voters, small town voters, rural voters, suburban voters. The only groups who disagreed, Danny, were progressives, Democratic women and people who identify as liberal or very liberal. So the only place the economy is not doing well is in this liberal coastal elite bubble. But in the rest of America, the economy is people feel better about their lives. And that's what Donald Trump ultimately campaigned on. Wait, let's correct that. Statistically, of course, the economy is doing better also in the bubble. People just don't want to admit it. (laughs) Unbelievably deluded by their hatred of Donald Trump. And, you know, I'm as bored by that as I am with Donald Trump's Twitter account. So, you know, (laughs) you don't like people doing well. That's a shame for you. I'm with you on this. What's number nine? Number nine. He implemented work requirements for food stamps. Everybody on the left went crazy. Oh, my gosh, he's going to he wants people to starve. He's going to take people's food away right as Christmas comes around. Mr. Scrooge, give me a break. This is great. Yeah, look, you know, this is one of those left right divides. But the former president of AEI, Arthur Brooks, spent a lot of his career talking about the dignity of work. You mentioned that in your column. I think if, if people are able to work, if they're in an economy where we are basically at full employment and they are not working, that's shame on them. And we should be a society that helps those who need the most. But I am not down with the notion that uh, we should take money away from the genuinely poor, the genuinely needy, the genuinely disabled, the real, you know, the real poor of our nation and give it to people who just don't feel like having a job because they can get welfare, they can get on assistance. And so, you know, that's got to get sorted out. It got sorted out in the Reagan administration. It got sorted out in the Clinton administration. I'm with you on this one as well. I hate God. We're, we're in agreement. Wait, what's number eight? We've got to find something <laughs> to disagree about. Number eight. He got NATO allies to cough up more money for our collective security. Yeah, well, he did. He did. Uh, But there's a real downside to this as well. There's no question. Let's face the reality. Our NATO allies have been disinvesting in NATO for decades. And every single president, Obama, Bush, other Bush, every secretary general has called them out on this. And they've never done anything. Donald Trump shocked the bejesus out of them by threatening NATO. And they have up their spending, as you know, by $130 billion, our allies. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you remember that question I asked you? I don't remember whether I asked you on air. I said, what do you think is more likely in a second Donald Trump turn? Him retaliating against an Iranian attack on our allies or us withdrawing from NATO? Do you remember what you said? Um, I don't know, remember what I said. What did I say? You said withdrawing from NATO. Yeah, and I take it back. Is... <laughs> I don't okay. think I don't think I, I... that he's going to withdraw from NATO, Danny. And look, I will tell you this: I worked for the Secretary of Defense, and I worked for the President of the United States as a speechwriter. I've probably been to eight or nine NATO summits or ministerials in various countries around the world, and I wrote the speeches over and over again that said NATO countries need to meet their commitments to the alliance, you need to increase your defense spending, and they never did it. They never did it. And when he took office, there were only a handful of countries that were meeting. They they agreed to spend 2% of GDP on defense. That is, especially if you're Germany, the wealthiest country in Europe, and you're not spending 2% of GDP on defense for shame. You know, Rumsfeld used to call these guys, they're the the non-paying members of the country club. And, you know, he got them to do it. And he got them to do it by scaring them and by really raising questions about whether the United States was going to stay in the alliance. I don't think he's actually going to pull out of the alliance, Danny, but I think scaring them about the fact that he wasn't willing to reaffirm Article 5 commitment until they started coughing up some more money and paying their, sh- their way, I have no problem with it. It worked. You are too nice. That is just... <laughs> That is, uh, you know, and an end justifies the means argument. And I think Donald Trump is not solid on NATO. And I worry a ton about what he would do in the second term. Well, if actually, at the last summit, he was defe- it- he was defending NATO against Macron, who said NATO is brain dead. And he was actually he was in the position of saying, no, it's not brain dead. 
<laughs> well, you, Mark, you remember you remember what I said about that. We've we always hoped that you know that other leaders would have an influence on Donald Trump, and what we've discovered at that NATO summit was that actually Donald Trump had an influence on other leaders in that <laughs> they behaved at they behaved with the the immaturity and the petulance that we have come to expect. Washington suddenly leached over to Paris and London and Germany and you know and, and Canada, of course. Anyway, all right, number seven. Number seven. He stood with the people of Hong Kong. That is 100% true. I worried about this. I really did. I worry. I think the president has sort of a unified theory of China in which everything we do weighs against the odds of a trade deal. And Congress may have forced him into this, but I don't care. He still did it. He stood with the people of Hong Kong. It was absolutely the right thing for the leader of the free world to do. And I'm really proud about that. I, I love it when our country, and I know you do, love it, love it when our country stands with the people who need us. And you know what I loved? I loved watching the next day the images from Hong Kong of literally tens of thousands of people marching through the streets, waving American flags and singing the American national anthem. You know, the people of Hong Kong are our brothers in freedom. They are fighting for their liberty in the same way that our country stood up and fought for our own liberty once, and we need to stand with them. And I think this is part of a larger Trump administration approach to China that is pushing them hard on all fronts. You know, that we're pushing them on trade, we're pushing them on on the Uyghurs, we're pushing them in Hong Kong, and also Donald Trump, it's interesting, the Chinese, they keep threatening to crack down, but it's been months and they haven't. Part of that is because it's much harder to, you know, we were all worried about another Tiananmen Square. It's much harder to carry out Tiananmen Square in Hong Kong than it is when people are like sitting ducks in a big square in, in front of the Communist Party headquarters in Beijing. But also it has a lot to do with the fact that Donald Trump said, don't do that. <laughs> if you want a trade deal with me, yeah. don't do that. Kudos. Kudos to him for that. We did the right thing. And, uh, and we've got another one where I think we're going to agree. What's number six? Number six. His withdrawal from the INF Treaty is delivering China and North Korea a strategic setback. I think this is something we could call a John Bolton special. John, <laughs> at the best of times, doesn't like these sorts of treaties. And, uh, and when he was national security advisor, he rightly advised the president that the Russians were violating and have been in violation of this treaty. One of the things I really think is important that no one paid attention to is, you know, this was cited as, a, oh, the threat of nuclear war now comes closer because we withdrew from this treaty. That is BS. Okay. The Russians have been violating that treaty for years. When we pulled out of it, NATO issued a press release saying Russia is in violation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. They have been in violation. They've been warned. They were warned again to come in compliance. They didn't do it. It's time we stop tying the, our hands behind our back in terms of defending the American people, defending our allies, while we watch Russia violate this treaty. No doubt. And look, I support it from a Russia-specific standpoint. And, you know, just so people understand what this is, is that in the 1980s, we were deploying intermediate-range missiles in Europe. The Russians didn't want us to do that. And so we ended up having a treaty that barred both nuclear and conventional missiles of a certain range, short, intermediate range, uh, not short-range uh, battlefield missiles, not long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles, but these medium-range missiles. And this is this, we're not about to now deploy a bunch of intermediate range missiles to Europe again because we're not focused on Russia. This is, in my view, it's both a China and a North Korea play because, number one, China, I think something like 90 percent of the missiles that they are producing – would violate the INF Treaty if they had been a party to it. So China is making a massive investment in the kinds of weapons that are that are uh, barred by this treaty, and we have not been able to counter that because we were bound by this treaty that they were not a party to, but we were with Russia. And so this frees us to develop new weapons to counter the Chinese threat. And that's important because if you're having a regional standoff with China one day, and they have this capability, the only response we have is, well, we can nuke you with an ICBM, and they know pretty much that we're not going to do that. So this gives us a credible deterrent in the region. And then the second thing is, it's a, I think it's a great backfill in terms of North Korea, that if this, this the negotiations don't work, and we find ourselves in a situation where we have to deter North Korea, again, 
you know, mutually assured destruction with intercontinental ballistic missiles is one thing, but we can deploy these weapons in Guam. We can deploy these weapons uh, perhaps in Japan, conventional mm-hmm. ones. And, you know, we then you don't have to send carrier strike groups on these dramatic and temporary assignments to the Korean Peninsula because we can keep them in our crosshairs of an immediate st- conventional strike at any moment. So this is a, a really important for the strategic balance in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I think it's a great thing he did. We're about to hit a, a record in our podcast, which is that we're about to agree on, on something else as well. What's number five? Number five. His maximum pressure campaign is crippling Iran. Yeah, it really is. Look, you know, you and I have talked about this most recently on our our podcast uh, with the Secretary of State about the sort of schizophrenic policy that the Trump administration has toward the Islamic Republic. You know, on the one side, we want (laughs) we want we seem to want regime change. And on the other side, the president seems to want to sit down with the Ayatollahs and make nice. But. Let's set that that question aside, which we dealt with there. Maximum pressure is really, really hitting the worst people in Iran the hardest. No doubt. And look, this is, I mean, if you look at right now, when Trump came into office, Iran was on the march across the Middle East. Today, the Iranian economy is contracting. Inflation is is spiraling. Uh, The regime has been forced to cut funding to its terrorist proxies like Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis in Yemen, Shia militias in Iraq, the Assad regime. Even the Iranian uh, military and even they're the last to get hit, but they're getting hit, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And the Iranian people now, as part of a result of this, because the Iranian government, you know, when they were flush with cash after uh, the Obama administration, they didn't pass those benefits on to the Iranian people. Right. They use that money to fund all these uh, all these nefarious groups around the world and that line their own pockets. And now that the economy is contracting, they say, well, we've got to raise gas prices. And the Iranian people said, uh, no. <laughs> and we've had the largest protests in Iran since the 1979 revolution under, underway. That wouldn't be happening without this policy. So this is we are succeeding in destabilizing the Iranian regime. We are, and and that's all to the good. This is one of the most serious threats we face in the world. You know, there are others, obviously, but all credit to the Trump administration for, for hanging tough on this in the face of a lot of criticism from our allies and from others. They've been focused, they've been creative, and they're doing a good job. All right, finally. Let's, let's see if we can get the streak going, right. keep the streak going. <laughs> it's over. What's ah. the for? Number four. His terror threats have forced Mexico to crack down on illegal immigration. Yeah. You and I talked about this when we had Roger Noriega, our colleague at AEI, on. And uh, all I can say is that's not what those tariffs are for. You and I talked to Rob Portman. Rob Portman actually said he wanted to take away this this legal uh, privilege, which is to impose so-called national security tariffs. He may have gotten the Mexicans to do the right thing. He may have persuaded them. Tariffs are not an omnidirectional tool. At a certain point, people are going to start using them against us. And then what's going to happen? You know what? We've got the biggest, strongest economy in the world. I'll take that fight any day. Look, he's had he has two twin achievements in Mexico uh, in terms of bringing the Mexicans to heel. Number one, he got the uh, he got them to agree to the U.S. Mexico Canada trade agreement, which is the new and improved NAFTA from the perspective of of the administration. That would not have happened without the threat of tariffs. And then for the first time, Mexico is actually enforcing its own immigration laws. The Mexican government itself, in its own negotiating documents, promised. In order to avoid these tariffs, we will enforce our immigration laws for the first time. You know, that's what they should be doing. The Mexican government is sending, as a result of this, 6,000 National Guard troops to their southern border, which is where the problem should be stopped in the first place, not when it gets to our southern border. And they're keeping these caravans from coming in. They are also holding people inside the country instead of allowing them to come in, come to the United States uh, to, to claim asylum. Most of those asylum claims are not legitimate claims of asylum. And they're actually enforcing their their immigration laws. That is a the, whatever your perspective of whether you agree or how of how he did it. That's a good thing for America because we should be a country of we're a country of immigrants, but we're also a nation of laws. We want I think we should have a lot more people coming into this country legally, but I, we should not have be tolerating people coming in illegally. And the way to stop it is to get Mexico to do it. And you know. 
in the Bush administration, we didn't get them to stop it. And in the Obama administration, they didn't get them to stop it. It's only when Donald Trump used this tool that it worked. Yeah, well, we could threaten to nuke them as well, Mark, and I'm sure they would pay attention. The The point is, no, but the point is, slightly different. Tariffs tariffs hurt the American people as much as they hurt others. Those kinds of threats, to my mind, look, you know, we've, we've adjudicated this before, but to my mind, big major mistake in using these to threaten our allies, to threaten the Mexicans, to threaten the Canadians, to threaten all the rest of it. All right, we're coming back to domestic policy with number three. Number three. He delivered the biggest blow to Planned Parenthood in three decades. And this is one I have to explain a little bit. Donald Trump uh, implemented something called the Protect Life Rule, which prohibits Title X family planning funds from going to any clinics that perform on-site abortions. U.S. law prohibits funding, taxpayer funding of abortion, and Planned Parenthood was using this as a workaround to subsidize clinics where abortions were being performed. And they announced this year that they are leaving the Title X program. That is a major pro-life victory, and I'm a pro-life American, and I think it's great. Yeah, I'm going to just you know, recuse myself on this issue because you and I don't agree fully, and and so I'm going to I'm going to do something heretofore unknown, both in our podcast and in my family, and keep my mouth shut. (laughs) Okay. Well, I will only say one thing. When people ask the question, why do Christian conservatives tolerate Donald Trump? This is why. So this is the this protect life rule is something that, you know, Yuval Levin, our colleague here at AEI, when he was in the Bush administration, he tried to get the Bush administration to do this. And he said it was the most contentious interagency meeting he's ever had. And he ultimately he couldn't get it done. And they proposed it to Donald Trump. And he said, yeah, we'll do it. And it's done. This is why people who are conservative Christians support him despite all the things, the the icky things that we don't like. It's because he icky, is... Be- icky, immoral. Thing. Yes, all of that. Uh, because this is, you know, if you are a pro-life person, this is one of the fundamental issues of our time. And he's delivering and he doesn't hesitate. And he's arguably the most effectively pro-life president in American history. And that matters to a lot of Americans. I think a quarter of American voters are evangelical Christians. A lot of conservative Catholics like me too. Uh, This is really important. So this is why uh, this is one of the main reasons why Donald Trump won the presidency and why he's got a real good shot at reelection. Well, we'll see soon enough. We're we're back to vigorous agreement again. (laughs) Okay, number two. Number two. He ordered the operation that killed Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Yes, he did. And yay. You know something? I don't think people appreciate what kind of guts that that takes. And you can, again, you can say that Donald Trump does things out of ignorance. Maybe. You can say that Donald Trump is motivated by all the wrong things. Maybe he is. You know what? Anytime you see American forces flying in under cover of darkness, taking out a terrorist leader, and then you add an awesome, awesome dog to the mix, as far as I'm concerned... (laughs) You know, give me my flag. I am going to wave that. I loved it. And I thought it was absolutely the right call. And, you know, if you want to say a lot of critics said, both you and I both heard them. You know, oh, well, it wasn't it wasn't Donald Trump who did it. It was the troops. Like, oh, is that what you said when Barack Obama took out uh, took out Osama bin Laden? I don't think so. So <laughs> kudos to Trump for having the guts to do this. And as you rightly point out, not everybody has those guts. No. And one of the people who doesn't have those guts is Joe Biden. So Joe Biden, you know, you brought up the bin, bin Laden operation. Joe Biden advised President Obama not to do it. Don't pull the trigger. And you know why he advised him not to do it? He said it could hurt your reelection. I mean, talk about yeah. bad judgment. You know, this is the kind of decision that you've got the the man who was responsible for the death of thousands of Americans on September 11, 2001, in your sights. You are highly confident that you can get him, and he hesitates because of politics. Are you kidding me? We had Ken Pollock on the podcast recalling the uh, Desert One operation when Jimmy Carter tried to rescue the hostages and what, a, what an absolute debacle that was. And that arguably cost him re-election. So this was a really risky decision. Trump didn't hesitate, according to everybody I've talked to in the administration who was in the room at the time. And kudos to him for taking this guy out. The world is better off with this guy sleeping with the fishes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Literally. 
uh, I know. <laughs> it, 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 yes, it is. It made me laugh. And, it, you know, you, you know why my, my weak spot. Dogs and Godfather references. All right. Mark. Dum, dum, dum. Number one. He has continued to appoint conservative judges at a record pace. Let me just tick off some statistics for people. The Senate just confirmed Donald Trump's 50th pick for the Federal Circuit Courts of Appeal. I mean, the fact that he put Kavanaugh and Gorsuch on the Supreme Court is, you know, a dream come true for constitutional conservatives. But these appellate courts, this these circuit courts of appeal are hugely important because the Supreme Court only takes up about 80 cases a year. So these appellate courts, you know, have a final say in 60,000 cases. And in three years, Donald Trump has appointed just five fewer circuit court judges in three years than Obama did in his entire eight years. And he has flipped three of those courts from a liberal to conservative majority. This is going to have an impact on a whole array of issues that are just fundamental to our society, from national security to Second Amendment rights, to the right to life, to the right to religious liberty. This is, again, another reason why constitutional conservatives, Christian conservatives, people who are concerned with religious liberty and free speech and all these fundamental freedoms that are being assaulted through the judicial system by the activist judges of the left, why they vote for Donald Trump. Yeah, that's right. Mitch McConnell, the much reviled Mitch McConnell, likes to say, we and the Senate are in the personnel business. You know, people who don't like this, go read your constitution. This is what the Senate does. And when you talk about the stakes, when you talk about what's the art of the possible, when you talk about why it is that people want the the Senate in the hands of a particular party, this is one of the biggest reasons. It's not confirming ambassadors, much to my regret. It's not confirming members of the administration, much to my regret. It is confirming judges. And uh, I will say, in terms of legacy, you know, we've got a lot of great ambassadors and a lot of great administration officials. But in terms of legacy, the impact on decision making, hopefully, God, fingers crossed, the impact on tort law, frivolous use of the courts, abuse of the courts, all of those things, this is going to have a ripple effect for a century. Absolutely. So let's, let's uh, I've got at the end of the column, I've got the honorable mentions, the top things that didn't that didn't make the top 10 list. And I'll just tick them off real quickly. We don't have to debate them all, uh, but I just want to list them for, nope. for our listeners. I noted that despite an inexcusable 55 delay, day delay, he gave Ukraine the lethal aid that the Obama Biden administration refused to deliver, which is a fact. Everybody running around saying how terrible it was that Trump held up this aid. You know, where were you when uh, when when they were asking for when the Obama administration uh, was being asked for RPGs and they gave them meals ready to eat instead. He secured the release of more American citizens abroad. This administration has a has a record focused like a laser beam on getting people freed from regimes like Iran, uh, North Korea and other places. He launched an un- unprecedented cyber attacks on Iran. I know we have a little bit of disagreement on the on, on that one, uh, but uh, he's using cyber weapons in a way no president has ever done before. Uh, he approved a major arms sale to Taiwan, gave them everything they asked for, despite the angry opposition of communist China. He sanctioned China for its oppression of the Uyghurs, and he still made no major concessions to North Korea. Uh, you, I know you want him to do more there, but uh, but that's a good thing in and of itself. Yeah, Mark. Wow. It's almost as if Donald Trump is a good president. Gee. Well, I will tell you, Danny. <laughs> so I'm, I'm keeping score here, and I've got my top 10 list, and you disagreed with two. That's true. On the other <laughs> hand, we've got we've got a whole nother podcast. Yes, we do. Of, of top 10. And I'm going to add my, you know, coda of the other 50, 60, 70 worst things. And I'm really, really looking forward to that one. Hey, thanks, folks, for listening. Um, and, and thank you for being part of this podcast experience with us. Absolutely. So next up, does the good outweigh the bad? We're going to review the top 10 worst things Donald Trump has done. And Danny's going to weigh in heavily on that one. I sure am. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.